you. Good morning. Um, you guys are looking well this morning. <laughs> uh, so I just wanted to say, first off, I'm really excited to be here at the Buddhist Geeks Conference. It's my first time at the conference, but I've been listening to the podcast for many years. And um, I'm also really excited because I know that this is the first time that the Buddhist Geeks Conference has addressed issues of um, diversity and uh, racial justice in any kind of official capacity. Um, I have 20 minutes to do this. <laughs> and, uh, you know... I can tell from the laughs, you guys know it's, it's totally not enough time. But so I just wanted to, um, I guess, let you know how I'm going to be entering into this conversation. One, I, I promised to talk about waking up to uh, power and privilege in our communities. And I'm going to focus on race-based power and privilege. I understand that this is not the only way that power and privilege shows up in our communities. But I'm hoping by uh, taking this, this doorway in that we might be able to gain some insights and then use them in other other ways in our communities. And then the second thing is that I really like to enter into this as a conversation. Um, so think about this as a statement in a conversation that for some of us is ongoing. It's something that we've been involved in for a really long time. And for some of us, we're just kind of jumping into the conversation right now. Um, so I'm talking to you not as um, an expert, but as a friend, as a uh, a community member, as somebody who cares. And I hope that it's a conversation that we can continue uh, here at Buddhist Geeks and also beyond the conference um, with each other and back home at our sanghas. So I think that's enough of a preamble. <laughs> um, I'd, like to, I'd like to enter into this conversation by talking about an article that I read recently in a magazine called Color Lines. It was an article by uh, the author and activist Rinku Sen, and it was called The Racist Mind. Um, just a little light summer reading. You know? <laughs> so in this article, uh, Sen uh, attempts to draw a connection between the way that our brains, um, our minds really process information and the misperception of self and other that is at the heart of the racist encounter. And I know that she wasn't speaking specifically to contemplative communities with this article, but I, I really felt that her conclusions could have some profound impacts on the way that we as individual meditators uh, approach one another and interact with the world, as well as what we as a contemplative community might be able to bring to some of the incredible work that uh, social justice organizations are already doing in service of um, opening up our hearts to one another. So when she begins the article, Sen uh, cites a poll that was done by the Pew Center in which researchers went around and asked Americans about their, mm, their level of satisfaction with the outcome of the George Zimmerman trial. And the researchers found that uh, of the Americans they polled, about 30% of white Americans were dissatisfied with the verdict compared with 86% of black Americans. So this is a huge disparity, right? And Sen hypothesizes that one of the reasons for this disparity is that people of color might be more attuned to the way in which implicit bias might have influenced the way that George Zimmerman responded to Trayvon Martin and that resulted in the, the shooting of this young boy. So implicit bias is the word that uh, social psychologists use to describe the phenomenon by which we have prejudices that we're completely unaware of, but that um, impact the way that we uh, speak and act and show up in the world, right? So the, the sense thought is perhaps it's by way of implicit bias that Zimmerman saw an unarmed black teenager and perceived him as a, a threat to his gated community. And that perhaps it's also by way of implicit bias that a jury could have concluded that any reasonable person would have been threatened and that Zimmerman had every reason to shoot and kill Trayvon Martin. So it's clear that implicit bias um, has a potential to, to cause us to do great harm. And Sen looks deeper at this issue to kind of get to the source of, okay, where, where does implicit bias live in the mind and how can, we, how can we work with this? And for this, she turns to a... Uh, psychologist, and he's actually a Nobel Prize winning economist, uh, Daniel Kahneman. Some of you guys might be familiar with his work. So he wrote this um, best-selling book called Thinking Fast and Slow. And in the book, he proposes that our minds 
our thinking and perceiving mind processes information on essentially two systems. So system one, uh, what I think maybe Rick Hansen would call the reactive mind, is uh, fast, it's intuitive, it's emotional. It kind of makes decisions by pulling together lots of bits of information, um, limited information, and then matching them up with our um, past experiences, but also with our uh, expectations, with our belief systems, with our implicit biases, right? So it's believed that in system one is where most uh, kind of prejudice occurs. Right? System two, on the other hand, is slower, it's more deliberate, it's rational. It's the system that can actually, um, where we can actually apply right effort as, uh, as Buddhist practitioners and uh, kind of fact check the decisions that system one makes, right? So um, asking of our perceptions, is it true? You know, does this need to be said now? Does this need to be said by me now? <laughs> You know, um, so I believe this is what uh, Rick Hansen might call the the responsive mind, and this is where I got kind of excited about the potential for um, for Buddhist practitioners to be involved in this process of waking up to power and privilege. Uh, Sen acknowledges that though we understand that prejudice, for the most part, happens at the level of implicit bias in this system one that most social justice organizations approach racism not at the level of implicit bias, but at the level of behavior. She writes, at the Applied Research Center, which is the organization that publishes the Color Alliance magazine, we try to achieve racial equity by focusing on impact rather than intention because most people aren't conscious enough of their bias for it to qualify as intentional. So, you know, I think the work that the Applied Research Center does is, is incredibly powerful, and I think it's um, just important to transform oppressive institutions at the level of structure. And then I'm also aware that institutions are made up of individuals, right? And individuals uh, with implicit biases are what we in the Buddhist community would call views. In the Buddhist teaching on the Eightfold Path, he describes how our views... Uh, become our thoughts, become our speech, become our actions, and how we relate to one another. And so I got really excited reading this article because I, I thought, wow, as contemplatives, we spend so much time um, noticing our thoughts as they're arising, our feeling tones as our, they're arising. Right? And I think that for this reason, we're particularly well positioned to do this work of waking up to power and privilege, not only in our sanghas, but also in ourselves. So reading this article reminded me of an incident that, uh, that happened when I was a freshman at Reed College. Um, I was one of the very, very, very few people of color on that campus, and I was asked by a classmate to participate in a, a study on implicit bias that was online. Some of you guys might be familiar with this. There's several universities that have them. And this test, for those of you who don't know, essentially consists of, for me, consisted of uh, a screen and there were two pictures that came up at a time, usually one white face and one black face. And I was instructed to click on the face that seemed to me to be nicer, uh, more friendly, the one that I was more comfortable with. And the student who was helping me do the test uh, encouraged me to do it really, really quickly so that I was engaging that kind of system one snap judgment mind. And uh, to make a long story short, when the results came back, it uh, said that I had a slight preference for white faces. And I was devastated. <laughs> um, because, you know, here I was as this 19-year-old. I'm young. I'm educated. I'm, uh, you know, got some radical politics on me. I, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I have black friends. I have black family members. I am a person of color. And I have this, this preference for white faces, you know? And, um, and so I really, I was, I was so ashamed. I was so embarrassed. I really shoved this experience into the closet and didn't think of it or speak of it again, really, until I saw this article. And I think that's a really common response when we, when we encounter kind of aspects of our view that we, that we don't like, that we didn't know we had, is to kind of turn away and say, no, it's not me, and, and, and shove it into the corner and never tell anybody about it. Um, and... I'm grateful that I have this, this Buddhist practice because in it, you know, I, I know that the Buddha 
encouraged us not to turn a, a, away from those aspects that we would have at, at the door, you know, those aspects of, and racism is, is suffering, you know, wherever it exists. Uh, not everyone who's involved in a racist counter is oppressed, but everyone suffers, right? And so um, we're asked in this path not to turn away from our suffering, but to actually turn towards it. The, the Buddha's instructions on the first noble truth is that suffering is to be known, right? And knowing suffering is the first step to, to becoming free. And what I didn't understand when I was so ashamed and what I understand now uh, about implicit bias is that I wasn't entirely responsible for the formation of my implicit bias. And, uh, you know, we don't have time for a history lesson today, but I, I trust we're all familiar with the myriad ways in which at the level of, of law and cultural institution and spiritual institution um, that, you know, myth, the myth that's been propagated that, that white faces are, are good and nice and safe and that black faces are bad and mean and criminal. And if you have any doubt about this, you know, um, uh, you just watch a couple hours of TV and I'm sure you'd be convinced. And our, our education and our politics and even our spiritual um, practice don't necessarily make us immune to uh, this, the formation of this implicit bias. But what our meditation practices can do is build the capacity for us to become aware of the subtle thoughts and feelings and responses to other people and to our environment as they arise and to be able to pause and say, you know, is it true? How do I know? So when Sen says that most people aren't conscious enough for their bias to qualify as intentional, I, I would have to argue that in, for us in this community, in this regard, we are not most people. And as Lodra said, with great power comes great responsibility. So the title of this talk is Waking Up to Power and Privilege in Our Communities. And um, I chose the title Waking Up to reference the translation of the Pali word Buddha, right? It's often translated as just simply one who is awake. And most of the people that I know on this, in this path of practice are, um, yes, we're in it for the stress reduction and the other health benefits associated with meditation. But there's a sense that like, we really want to, we really want to wake up, you know, and it follows then that we have a sense that maybe there's places in which we're asleep, right? Places that we have a, a big sense that we're not quite awake and aware to our moment to moment experience, but we want to be, you know, we have this desire to be. And I would say that this desire is, um, you know, to me, it feels like love or, um, Last night when Rick talked about the fourth Vedana of, you know, this heartfelt quality of wanting to be uh, closer to our experience, wanting to be closer to other people, wanting to be, you know, the love of truth, the love of life. Um, so we have this desire uh, to wake up. And I think that the truth is, as I experience it is that in Western Buddhist communities, for the most part, we're really still very much asleep to the way that power and privilege operate um, in our communities. And while sleeping, I think that we have um, unfortunately, um, unintentionally constructed what feels like, you know, spiritual gated communities where we feel like we just want to be safe and we just want to be comfortable and we just don't want to be challenged so much. Um, but uh, again, the Buddhist path isn't, um, for what I understand about being safe, it's about being free. Um, I was, <laughs> this is one of my favorite slides. I was, <laughs> I was in, um, uh, <laughs> this is how I do it, you guys. <laughs> I was in a Dharma center and having a discussion with someone that I um, had actually become fairly close to, close enough that she felt comfortable asking me this question. <laughs> She's like, hey, you know, why why don't black people like the Dharma? <laughs> and I was like, you know, I was telling a friend later that she said this and he's like, you should have asked her, why do white people like it so much? You know? <laughs> but um, that's not what I said. <laughs> I, um, I, and I, and I, I guess I noticed that, you know, looking around that room and even really looking around this room, um, it wouldn't be unreasonable to, to assume that, oh, well, maybe black people just don't like the Dharma. You know, where are we? 
Um, and I was reminded of a conversation I had with one of my teachers, uh, Gina Sharp, who was one of the first uh, co-teachers of a people of color meditation group or meditation retreat that happened at Garrison Institute on the East Coast. And for this first retreat, she was really nervous. She thought, you know, there are so few of us in communities. Um, is anyone even going to show up to this? I have 100 spots. Am I going to fill it? And she ended up turning people away. That people were coming out of the woodwork. They weren't coming to Buddhist you know, Dharma centers, but they were practicing in their homes. They were practicing with small communities. And she said she kept having this conversation with, um, with, with people in, in the, the retreat that were basically like, hey, you know, we love the Buddha. We um, are down with the Dharma. And as, and as Lojar said, don't talk to me about the Sangha, you know? Um, so just to, just to say, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not the Dharma, you know, it's, it's us. So waking up to uh, the reality of the world that we live in, uh, a world that in which racism is still very much alive is um, what I would consider to be an act of love. And it's not the kind of love that is like the rainbows and ponies kind of love. You know, it can feel very uh, tender and especially for those of us that aren't used to having these kinds of conversations, um, it can be downright uncomfortable. Um, what I want to say is that for people of color, many people of color, and I'm included in this camp, you know, we have to do a lot of like emotional and spiritual labor to be able to show up in communities where we might be the only one. And um, what I'd like to encourage us to do is kind of redistribute this labor so that we're all taking part in um, the work that needs to be done to diversify our communities. And what kind of work might this be? Um, well, for many years, people of color groups have been getting together in sanghas to talk about um, the ways in which we experience the sangha, the ways that we can um, help use the dharma to heal the trauma that we've experienced as a result of racism. And I think it would be really cool um, if, uh, if a group of white people got together and discussed how racism has affected them. You know, as I said before, racism is suffering. Everybody suffers. Not everybody's oppressed, but everybody suffers. And um, from talking to a lot of my white friends and allies, there's, there's feelings there that, that um, need to come out of the closet. <laughs> I think also um, calling in outside organizations uh, – to help us work with um, anti-racism and uh, looking at white privilege in our communities. And a lot of groups are doing this. I had the privilege of participating in an undoing racism training with the staff and uh, teachers of Insight Meditation Society in Barrie, Massachusetts last fall. And someone asked Bob Agoglia, who was at the time, I think still is for a little bit longer, the executive director of IMS, why we're doing this work, you know, from his perspective. And he, he said, you know, I think that if we don't diversify, we're going to die out. And I don't think that that's because people will cease to come to this retreat center or will cease to make money, but that if we don't diversify, we're going to cease to be relevant to the world. And we might as well be dead. And a di diversity is a really good step. Diversity, um, when we're in diverse community, it helps us to wake up to the uh, views and attitudes that we don't even know we have until we come into contact with someone who is other to us, right? It's really easy to, um, you know, imagine that I'm not homophobic if I never come into contact with anyone who's queer. It's really easy for you know, me to imagine that I, that I don't have a distaste for um, people with disability in, until I come in contact with them, right? So it's important that we, we, um, we build a diverse community, but also diversity isn't, for me, the end goal. The, um, I think the big vision, the big view, would be to have uh, equity, to be able to um, share power at the level of leadership. And so um, uh, that's, what, that's what I'm going for. So I, I guess I just want to leave you guys with the 
belief that I have that this is a workable situation. And that at this moment in Western Buddhism, I believe we're really called to work with this. Um, we have the tools. I think so many of us have the desire. And so let us continue. And if we haven't started, let us begin. Um, It's my sincere wish that uh, we, as a community, are able to wake up to the truth of interdependence, to to feel connected, and to allow that connection to open our hearts. Um, So thank you for listening, and um, I'll be... (laughs) Thanks. I'll be... (laughs) I'll be, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, there's, I had so much more to say, um, and there is so much more to say, and I would love to hear from you guys. I know that um, I'll be hanging out for a Buddhist Geeks Unplugged session, and please come find me if you want to um, continue the discussion. And also, I believe that um, online Tricycle Magazine is hosting a, a web forum, so if you don't get a chance to um, talk it out with somebody, please write it out, and let's, let's continue the conversation. Right, thank you. Thank you.